Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. I need painters. I need painters. <laughs> All week. Which so, week? This week? This week. Okay, this week. We, I have the electricians showing up on Friday, so everything in the classrooms and offices needs to be painted, sanded, primed, ready for them. So if you can do the weekend, or, or not the weekend, you can do you might, the evening. I'm going to be here working the night shift on Wednesday. You can okay. come for prayer and we can work, or you can come during the day. Oh, painters. We yeah. need painters all week long, and yeah. as you can come or whatever, call. Yeah, tell me what you, if you're going to be here. Let me know. I, I can set you up and get you started. And uh, so, anyway. And there we go. What, where, what, what colors go where. And then, and in then. the refrigerator, there are eggs. Oh. Take the eggs, please. Eggs. <laughs> Three eggs in the refrigerator. If you don't, my friend Herb will not like you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you hear that there? Three eggs in the refrigerator, so don't forget. Make it when we get done, make sure you put them out there on the counter. That would be forward. Yeah, we won't forget. Yeah. Otherwise, and then uh, the only other thing, reminder, again, is that we're going to be coming around the corner here sooner, about a, really, I guess, about a month out, is a men's retreat at Bucky Park. Our theme is uh, God, are you still there? If you have questions, either contact Bill or myself, but guys, you know, write it out, put it out to. Uh, uh, put it on your calendar, ask for some days off if you need it, uh, or if you're working from home, you know, change your work location to be out there. <laughs> so, uh, whatever it takes, so there you go on that. Is there any other announcements that we need to know about here? Alrighty. On that note, let's pray and get ready to dive into the Word. So, Father God, we just uh, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the word of God that you have provided for us. I pray now that, Lord, you would help us to uh, uh, be alert, to pay attention, to think about what your scripture has to say. I pray, Father, that uh, the information we're going to go over will uh, stick to our hearts, stick to our minds, and it'll rattle around in there and cause us to uh, rejoice in you more, to think of you more, to... Uh, want and thirst for even more understanding. And we just ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, wasn't sure if we were going to have an overhead this morning. We, we knew that it might, but I always try to, with everything going on, plan ahead. So I uh, just want to alert you what's in your uh, thing. So you'll, we, you know, want to definitely, we have some handouts in there, so you might want to grab those in your bulletin. Uh, we'll get to them. I'll alert you to when we get to them. I have them out. Uh, one part of our lesson, we're going to be going over some terms and definitions. <laughs> I have in your in your bulletin on the other side of the uh, outline page. I have supplied those for you, so you can go over them and and uh, not have to fret trying to scribble them out, write them out if you got them. So that's there. So uh, there you go on that and. There we go. I think we're going to be able to kick it off. So, uh, Rapture Part 2. I think we might have Rapture Part 3, maybe Rapture Part 4. <laughs> I don't and know. Then we'll just get Rapture. Then we'll just get Rapture. Yeah. 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 Validate all the right into it right there. That's it. 
know, that would Grand be that would be fun. Right that would be awesome. So, uh, again, uh, last week we introduced the subject of the rapture. Uh, talked a little bit about it. We uh, talked about some evidence. That we went to the scripture to see where there was possibilities of uh, folks that were uh, they experienced something similar to the rapture, even with some potential phrases that seem to duplicate those very ideas. Um, then uh, we briefly touch some of the top three verses that talk about rapture, uh, if you will. We were looking at John chapter 14, 1 through 3, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So uh, probably the most classic ones. There are, uh, I've been doing uh, like at home, doing just this gigantic my own study paper, if you will, it's about 29 pages long now, and just all sorts of information. But even within those verses, I can tell you there are runner-ups, uh, verses that maybe allude to something like that, but are not as direct. And so keep that in mind when you're like, well, Robbie, that's only three. I've heard of this one or that one. It, it, that is probably true. It just... In the interest of time, I can only cover so many, but you know, I might put those out for you, throw those over the fence, give you more stuff to chew on uh, in that event. Uh, but in this morning, uh, you know, I was thinking about hitting some objections to the to uh, what I think is going to happen, what I'm convinced. Uh, but rather than that, I think I want to do is get uh, some overview of the theories. So you might be already familiar with them, but it's always good to look at them again. Uh, we're going to discuss some terms and, and some assumptions uh, assumptions that are made. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, do so, take a look at just an overview of some rapture theory. Okay, so uh, in your notes you'll have uh, something that looks like this. And so, and then we'll also bring it up up there too in the overhead. So in your, in your, in your notes, you'll have uh, this page that has the three different theories there. So first we have, uh, the, and I'm only gonna hit three, uh, and we'll talk about a couple others in a second, but the pre-tribulation rapture is one theory. Notice I'm using that word theory because we think we know, but we might be wrong. So here it is, just a basic outline of what's going on. You have your uh, Old Testament times before the cross. Uh, then you'll see a little cross on the graphic there. And then we have the church age. So a pre-tribulation rapture folks believe that right now we are in an age called the church age. It's, uh, it's different and that's where uh, when we're talking about some of the distinctions. This is part of the distinctions and some of the assumptions that are going on in this case. So then we have uh, the rapture is an event. Uh, you'll notice that it has some references down there where they think it fits. Uh, Revelation 4.1 potentially. I've heard even other theories in that, because you'll see that there's like a gap there between Revelation 4.1 and Revelation 6.17. So I've heard different things, even among the pre-tribulation group of exactly where the rapture is going to fit in there, which is very fascinating, very interesting. Uh, because what it, when it, you Bible students out there, you notice when you're looking at those chapters, the death chart talking about the seals in Revelation. It, uh, it shows a, a vision there where he's opening up seals of a giant scroll. And so there is some folks that believe that, that even with the last seal, that that actually may start the, the pre-tribulation rapture. So that's, a theory that's out there, possibility. Then you'll notice that then there's the full tribulation period. Three and a half years, three and a half years, seven years total. Uh, I, you'll hear me refer to that as the 70th week of Daniel. Remember a few weeks back we talked about Daniel and Daniel described a 70th week that is set for the nation of Israel. And then, then there's the second coming. Then after that, a thousand year reign of Christ, they call the millennial, millennium, and that's in Revelation chapter 20. All right, so let's go to the next one. We'll take a look at the mid-trib rapture. Okay, so the mid-tribulation rapture uh, 
has the Old Testament and the cross. We're all, they also understand that there's the church age. Uh, but then at some point, going into the tribulation period, uh, most feel that like three and a half years in is where uh, the rapture will happen in there. Uh, and then the reason they, uh, there's a distinction there is because they'll look at the, the second half as the great tribulation. So that's a distinction that's there. And so in that second three and a half year period, the rapture happens before, and then at the end is the second coming of Christ, then the millennium. Millennium. Yeah. Hard to say the millennium. I got the tongue twister there. <laughs> so the uh, millennium there, and a thousand years again, Revelation chapter 20. And then another prominent school of thought out that's out there is the post tribulation rapture. Go ahead to the next slide there. Post tribulation rapture. You see, again, they have the same Old Testament time for the cross. They talk about the church age. But in their uh, thinking and the way they read the Bible, that the church age uh, just goes right on through the tribulation period, that there is no uh, distinction between the times there. Um, and so then right at the end of that seven-year period, at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, then you see uh, a, a rapture happens, but then the second coming coincides almost directly with it. And so you're going up. And then they believe that that's just to we'll lead him in the air and come right back down and then reign with Christ during the thousand year period again, the millennium that's described. There. All right, so that's, uh, I don't have graphics for them, but there's also other views that are out there uh, that are not as prominent. Uh, probably one that's, that's uh, gaining in some popularity is called the pre wrath rapture, uh, where it's very similar to the mid trib rapture. Except they look at uh, where, uh, if I remember correctly, that uh, either the seventh seal or just before the great tribulation happens, that that's, they view that as the only part of the wrath. And so that pre-wrath is taken. Then there's those folks that uh, uh, read the different parts of Revelation and they'll see where the, the different groups show up. And so they have an idea that it's possible that they're partial raptures. Uh, a little bit of rapture here, a rapture here, rapture here, rapture here down the line. Uh, and that group, uh, in, within that group, uh, there's a lot of different raptures that they have. And so there's like, yeah, zombie, I, I see Bill, like the five, I've heard six, you know, six different raptures happening. Hey, it may happen that way. I, I don't know, but uh, it seems to me it's just like I'm more convinced otherwise. Now, one of the things. Uh, that I want folks to realize that when you study this, and believe me, I know you're going to hit websites and you're going to go to those, which is great. Those, those are out there. Uh, but I always find it's interesting is some of the language that e anybody can use. Okay, so there's language that, uh, that I think is unfair language that any of the folks of their views can have. And a lot of times what they'll sit there and say, well, such and such a theory is like, New. This is really big uh, against like the pre-tribulation rapture. As they'll say, oh, it's like brand new. But in fact, it's, it's been around for a long time. But that is also the case for the mid-tribulation and the post-tribulation views have all been around a long time. It's just that sometimes it's obscure references. But also we have to remember like when you study church history, you go back in, in church history, you're going to find, like, why wasn't such and such an issue talked about way back then? Well, let me be brutally honest. They didn't care. There were other issues that were in the forefront, uh, especially in the early church. When they, you look at the early church, the main issue that they were focused in on was who was Jesus? That was a big deal because there was some really big uh, false teachers going on and, and that was happening. Now, they were focusing in on who Jesus was, but you can find stuff about end times views within that. It's just a little bit harder to find. And, and again, the, the, the amount of time that they give to the subject matter was very small. Because you know, I, I went and did a search. I have a... 
I think were all the writings of the ancient church fathers. And so I can do a search. And yeah, I can find stuff like where they talked about the rapture. But I'm going to tell you, among thousands of pages of stuff, even when they had one view or another, it was just a snippet of what they were talking about. So it's, that's what makes it hard when we go back in time to try to figure out, like, well, what are these guys going? What are they thinking? It can make it very difficult to try to surmise, like, where they're coming from. And then also, it can be very difficult because their writing styles are so different than our English grammar. And it can make it very hard to, like, what is this guy, what is this early church father talking about? <laughs> like, and put it together because they're just going all over the places. Plus, also, some of their early church fathers, you know what we have? It says fragment. It's like, oh, yay. So that means we get a fragment of something, and you don't even know, well, what was the context that they were talking about? So there you go. So when you study, and I encourage you to go back, take a look at ancient church fathers. They got lots of information, and they have their stuff about this that's there from the different point of views. And, but it's always keep in mind, just like, just like when we read our Bible, we've got to establish context. What are they talking about? And, and then, like I said, it's going to be a run, run into difficulty where you're just like, I don't, we won't even know what the context is at all. And so there you go. So that's something to keep in mind. So those are the prominent rapture theories that are out there. Now let's, uh, let's get ourselves all weighed in a little bit deeper. Shake yourself, get yourself away, because here we go, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some terms that are important here. Because see, that's the whole thing. It's just like, whenever you're trying to discuss an issue, you wanna have terms. You wanna know what the definitions are. You wanna, because if we're talking to each other, if I say refrigerator, and you're thinking mailbox, we're talking two different things. You're just like, it's just like oh yeah, I keep putting my food in the refrigerator. Like, why are you putting your letters in there? I don't understand because you're using a different definition for a word that is out there. So it's always good to know your terms. And I always tell anybody when you're having a conversation, if you're having a theological conversation, if you're having any conversation, it's always like, and it's so tough to do sometimes. It's like, well, hey, what do you mean by that? Or you keep using this term, and like Princess Bride, you keep saying that word, but I don't think you know what it means. Yeah, it's like, uh, but it's always good to ask somebody. It's like, uh, hey, you're using this term, and I, I think I understand it this way. How do you understand that term? And that's really good. It's a great practice because then you can. Hey, it's always good to have our own definitions challenged sometimes because I may define something in a certain way, and I need to have my definition looked at to make sure it's, a, it's good accountability all the time. So let's take a look at some terms here. First one, and, and these, I tried to think of order of importance, uh, so I can't guarantee that it is, but when we get to the assumptions, I'm going to kind of go in the same order, okay? So imminency. Now this, as it says, as applied to the rapture, describes the timing of an event that is close at hand in its occurrence and carrying the sense that it could happen at any moment. So now this... Um, Another idea to this is that there is, um, and you might hear this term for where it says no prophetic events need to happen for the rapture to happen. Yet in imminency, events could happen, but they're not necessary events. Okay, so that's the idea. So the idea in, in imminency is it's imminent. Now keep in mind, in my opinion, I think that even the early church folks felt that it was imminent. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this, I think, next week or the week after. We're going to talk about some Bible verses that kind of point to this idea, this imminent coming of Christ. But keep in mind, you may say, well, if they thought it was imminent, and here we are 2,000 years, how was it imminent? Because it could happen at any moment. It's just that we don't know how big the moment is, and the stretch. So keep that in mind when somebody talks about imminency, that's what they're getting at is, is that at any moment and nothing needs to take place to happen ahead of time. This is why in our scriptures all the time, and even when we get to the end of Luke here, Luke re-reminds everybody to stay awake, be prepared, because it could happen 
at any moment. Uh, uh, so that, uh, here's an example of an imminent uh, understanding from James. James chapter 5, verse 8 through 9. It says, you also be patient. Because he's, the verse right before he talks about you know, trial, tribulation, things happening. He says, be patient. Establish your heart for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Then he goes on, he says, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So here he uses two phrases within one sentence of each other that uh, talk about the idea that when he says the Lord is at hand, he's like, meaning he's like right there. Ever go to the door and the doorbell has not rang, or maybe you're going out of a room and the door, nobody, and you open the door and there's somebody right there. You're like, yeah, you're like, ah. but that is is the sense that James is talking about. It's just he's Jesus is like right there. He is, and what's interesting is the hint is pointing out that they, in a sense, Jesus is like at the starting gate and has been there. Since that right. So that's the idea. So that's what when we're talking about being imminent, that's the idea. Okay, now another term to consider about this, and maybe it's like thinking, boy, who needs to define this? But you should think about it. And that would be the wrath of God. Alright, so let's bring that up. The wrath of God. And the word wrath itself is can be anger, and so it's really it's his anger, his righteous anger and indignation. And I, I put down, I included uh, a definition for indignation uh, because I'm like, well, I don't use the word indignation very often. You know, just like I might say I'm indignant on something, but I don't even use that word very often. I usually just say I'm frustrated or I'm mad or whatever. But the idea is indignation is, is anger aroused by injustice. And I, that's interesting that it would bring it up because of the idea is sometimes the day of the Lord or the God's wrath is called the day of indignation. Mm -hmm. So that, I thought it was significant to, to bring that up. So it's the righteous anger and indignation, that anger aroused by injustice of God, directed toward sinners, the wicked, and all who incite or commit sin against God. So that, that's the wrath of God, per se. And so uh, that's why it, and it's interesting to understand that because there's, you know, we get different Bible verses that say that we are not under wrath. Like uh, 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 John 5, 24. And it's out there and this, it points out the idea that uh, uh, he who believes in me is, is no longer under death and or no longer under the wrath of God and will not go through death. So there it is talking about the wrath of God. And there's other Bible verses that talk about that idea that we are no longer under wrath. Now we're going to talk about assumptions here in a little bit, but that's we still want to understand what we're talking about with the wrath of God. Because then the next one I want to talk about is tribulation. So tribulation generally means affliction, distress, or suffering. And this is my definition, so feel free uh, when I added, I added a commentary to this, is that this is the stuff of this fallen world, filled with fallen people who in turn interact with this world. This is what we see around every day. But everyone experiences, uh, Santa had a, an encounter with a counter the other day, and now she is suffering. And so that's Part of, there it is. You know, so, and we all can look at around in our lives, there's some element of affliction, uh, distress of some kind, or suffering. And so uh, this is important to know, and, and it's important to realize that this is, this is what we're going to deal with as Christians all the time. Example, Romans 5, 3, which says, uh, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. So this is the beginning of a set of verses that talk about character. And there he uses, the, Paul uses the words for sufferings twice. So in a sense, you, he could have used it, but we rejoice in our tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces endurance, or distress, or affliction. And so there it is. So this is 
this is what you and I, and it's like, that's why we always talk about where people will sit there and say, oh, if you become a Christian and everything's just working out hunky-dory. <laughs> well, did you guys miss this verse? You know, so this is, this is part of our life. This is what it is until that day, until we're called to heaven. There it is. You know, and so uh, now one of the things, so this is true, but we had wrath of God and tribulation. But, of course, uh, the Bible has something that talks about the great tribulation. Let's bring up Matthew uh, 24, 21. So, I hope I have it in here. Did, I, did we miss it? Uh, maybe I missed it. I was tired. <laughs> so, okay, Matthew 24, 21. It says, for then there will be great tribulation, such as never ha has not been from the beginning of the world until now, nor, no, and never will be. So that's Matthew 24, 21. Now this is where the phrase great tribulation is used. And just about everyone agrees uh, that this is especially talking about the second half of the seven year period. Okay, so even uh, pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, everybody agrees that the Great Tribulation is a designation for the second half of that time period. Um, but, again, this tribulation is extraordinary. It's extraordinary uh, It's because this affliction comes directly from God. The affliction upon the planet. The judgment, if you will, on the planet comes directly from God in the Great Tribulation because it talks about a real thing that he specifically initiates. So there is that. And keep in mind, I'm pouring in, pouring in some assumptions here, and we're going to get to them in a second. So uh, now let's come to one that we dealt with last week. My wife brought it up just a second ago. We're going to talk about the rapture again. Just want to bring this up because we want to make sure it's always good to repeat ourselves. That event that when uh, Jesus comes to earth and to instantly catch up all the Christians on earth up to him and meet in the air. These Christians include both those that have died and those living at the time. So that's the rapture. Uh, again, we talked about that, but then I wanted to bring up another term. That's, a, that's Sometimes you have to bring up one term in order to get to another one. That's where I want to talk about this. The second coming or second advent of Christ. Now this is where it can get confusing in our Bibles. This is why you know, when we think about our post-tribulation friends, they'll equate this directly to the rapture. And that's, we're going to come to that assumption. But the second coming or second advent uh, this can describe that over, see, this is why it gets confusing. Notice here, you'll be looking at it and be like, oh, you got two definitions there. Yes, I do. And I did that on purpose. So this can describe the overall events of the 70th week of Daniel, the second coming, the seven year period. And some use it that way. It's like, the second coming. That's, remember the other day I described how a wedding is one singular event, but it has several things going on within the wedding. It's like, I attended the wedding. Somebody said, oh, you went to the wedding, so you only saw them kiss the bride. Oh, no, I saw, saw them pray ahead of time, saw them they were coming down with their dad, and they said their vows, the whole thing, so I attended the wedding. So keep that in mind. So that's, when somebody says the second coming, or even Jesus is referring to it, it's not always referring to what I'm talking about next, where it said, and it can be specific, we refer to the moment when Jesus descends from heaven to assume his kingdom and gather Israel to himself. So that is a specific event. So keep that in mind. Feel free, and remember, my definition can be challenged. That much of this is my definition. I tried to figure out. And this is something to do for you guys who study the Bible. This is something that I've been practicing now for a little while. If you decide to define something a certain way, write it down somewhere. Because I realize I had to write down my definitions because I realized I'm going to have to tell you guys again. <laughs> and, so, and so I keep it. So I have my Robbie's 
theological dictionary that I have set up so that when I come back to a term, I can think, what did I define it as before? A, that keeps me consistent, plus also I can look at my own definition again and say, is that how I want to define it still? Or is that, I might have learned something more, I might have added some extra details to that definition. So I encourage you to do that. It allows you to think about the terms you're using and how we say them. All right, so this, uh, that second of the advent is probably best described in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16. I didn't put it up there, but if you want to go back there and check it out, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16, really gives uh, in-depth details of what I think is the specific event. All righty here, now let's whew, do the stretches again. Gonna be one last go here. Got lots of information. Get it rattled up. Get yourself alert. Yeah, yeah, you know, gotta do that. So now, if you look on the back of your other thing, we're gonna have, we're gonna talk about some assumptions. All right, so keep that in hand. And we're gonna have, I'm gonna have it up there, but I don't know how easy it will be to read compared to what you'll have in your handout. Okay, so. Got all these different theories. Got some terms and definitions there. Uh, but keep in mind that everybody has some basic principles when arriving at some conclusions of this event or possible timing of the event. And so we have to realize that each one of us, when we go to our Bibles, when we go to the Word, that we approach things with assumptions. We have things that we assume are true. Some, things, some of those things are good and correct. Sometimes our assumptions can be not good and not correct. And uh, that's, that's why it's always good. That's why we rub elbows together so that we can talk together and, and we talk about certain things. We can be confronted maybe about what we think and what we feel about the Bible. The biggest assumption that we can run into is that we have it right and they have it wrong. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that is, and the reason I say that is because we gotta be always honest with ourselves. When you, when you go to the Word of God, you gotta be honest. You gotta be like, all right, I'm approaching this with this assumption. I, I'm, I may be right, but I have to remember how I'm thinking about it and how I'm approaching it so that that way I can be fair. And then that way, maybe there's some challenging part of the Word of God that it's like, because if I don't acknowledge my assumption, I can just brush over something. Or God saying, hey, Robbie, pay attention to this little detail right here. This is important. Just because you think you know it, Robbie, doesn't mean you know it right. <laughs> so I always got to go back to it, which is one of the greatest blessings I enjoy as being a Bible teacher, I constantly am confronting myself with what I thought I knew. And uh, so there you go. So that's that's the part of it. So we must always remember this when we're coming at it. And so, full disclosure, I myself am convinced at the moment of the pre-tribulation rapture theory. That's what I'm most convinced of right now. Thus, when I approach this, I'm approaching it with a set of assumptions that I have gathered over time to approach that issue. Uh, things that I will correlate with what I think is true, okay? Again, we do this a lot of different ways, not just with the Bible, but with life, everything. So let's, let's review some assumptions here. So you're gonna notice that I start with some of our words that we were just using in the definition. So if you can't read that, it's on here too. So the first assumption, the first issue that we're going to look at is that term I talked about of imminency. It's, a, it's an assumption. So there you see, for a pre-tribulation rapture porcelain, the assumption behind that term is that the rapture can happen any moment, no necessary event prior. So that's an assumption. That's what I'm thinking when I think about that term. Now. Uh, if some of you hold these other views uh, and I get the assumptions wrong, please forgive me. I did the best I could, but I might not have got it right, okay? So 
keep your dead cats to yourself and rotten tomatoes, <laughs> the whole thing. You know, what what do I mean? mean? So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the mid-trip person, the, the assumption is a rapture can happen any moment. I think after the seventh trumpet, I think is what they're going for, maybe something else. But it's a, there's still an any moment idea to that, but it's different because of the no necessary prior events from the pre-trip. Our post-trip friends, when they think of intimacy, they think the second coming will happen at any moment when the seven year period is over. Now everybody, if you're looking at that, and they're, 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 honestly, you might run into some difficulties on anything else. I will tell you for uh, uh, generally that imminency is most uh, looked at from a pre-trip point of view. They, they think about it more than the other two points of view. Okay, so that, I just want to be, put that out there that that, and understand. All right, so now let's take a look at the next assumption. And that'll be about the wrath of God. So for a pre-trip assumptions about the wrath of God is that the wrath of God comprises the whole seven year period. <coughs> And is distinct from, remember I gave you a, an idea from general tribulation, that is distinct from that, and it's not directed at believers, even in a disciplinary sense. Okay, so that's the way, that's an assumption of a pre-trib rapture person, what they're looking at. And then for the wrath of God from a mid-trib point of view, it, the wrath of God uh, comprises the last three and a half year period. The first half is tribulation that is experienced by believer and non-believer alike. The second half is great, the great tribulation. Okay, so that's how they're how somebody will look at it. Post-tribulation person looks at the wrath of God as the whole seven-year period and is experienced by believer and non-believer alike. The whole kit and caboodle is is, is the wrath of God, but you're in it. Everybody's in it. Okay? So the next assumption that we're looking at. The assumption about the rapture versus the second coming. And you'll notice that I said it can apply to the rapture and resurrection. Remember last week I talked about that there is a difference. Some people will sit there and just say them synonymously. But we understand the rapture can only happen to somebody if they're alive. Resurrection only happens if they're dead. You know, that's, that's the idea. So there, there's a physical difference, but how they're applying it and what they're thinking about can come up in this kind of a situation. So for the pre-trib person, the rapture versus the second coming is two separate events. Rapture happens at the beginning, second coming at the end of the seven year period. And so, uh, but then the whole thing, remember I was describing from my point of view, so now I'm, I'm giving away some secrets here, but I'm thinking about the, the wrath of God as it's like, a, or the second coming, I also view that it's, it's describing the whole event too. Okay? But there is some distinctions we have. Uh, I believe the mid-trib uh, assumption is that the rapture and second coming are two separate events. Rapture at the middle of the seven year period, the second coming at the end of the seven year period. Very similar, very similar, actually. Uh, that's why I, 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 I'm probably, to be a, an example of disclosure, disclosure, I'm probably more sympathetic to a mid-trib understanding than I am to a post-trib understanding. Uh, because then they, they the post-trib, they see this and they're assuming rapture and second coming is one event that occurs at the end of the seven year period. I've read a lot of their writing. They, they, they will ridicule everybody else. And honestly, the other guy, they, they ridicule each other back and forth. They'll troll, nowadays they call it big trolling. They're, they're trolling each other back and forth. So they're, that's there too. So that's, again, I say that because we as Christians, we need to be careful about that. We need to be careful how we troll our brothers and sisters out there. We can disagree, but disagree in a, in a uh, an agreeable manner, you know, so that way we're, we're going, we're having gentleness, we're remembering what the big issues are here. Uh, last one, uh, distinction that I have on there is Israel and the church, and I, I didn't add a definition for this, I probably could have, 
but here the an assumption is Israel and the church. Generally, so this is, this is uh, let me say this too. Much of what I have is generalization. Okay? There are always going to be exceptions to the rule. So keep that in mind. Even within this. But generally what I've experienced is that for those who understand a pre-trib rapture, that Israel and the church are two distinct entities. And the church itself is assumed to not be part of the 70th week. And Israel is part of the 70th week. That assumption <coughs> is gotten from Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 9, where it talks about the 70th week. So many look at it and they're assuming that when Daniel is given this vision that it specifically pointed towards Israel. There's other things that would go with that too, uh, but I'm trying to keep it short so I don't bore you to death this morning. And then the mid-trib assumption on that, that believe, the church and believers are part of the first half, but then, then there's a distinction that the second half where Israel and the wicked are part of the second half. And so that there is like a distinction there, but it's how it plays out, it just comes out a little bit differently. Now our post-trip brothers and sisters out there, for them, in their mind, there is no distinction between Israel and the church. And that God has one plan for church. And that everybody, whoever believes, is the church. And that God is done with Israel and that we are Israel now. So our post-trip brothers and sisters will sometimes hold that assumption. Now, all these assumptions, as I pointed out, they all play out differently. And, and I did, I'm just scraping the very top of the, of the, of the cream pie here, you know, just like just finding the, getting the crust a little bit off of it, because these assumptions, you know, like especially Israel and the church, that's one where I really see uh, those assumptions can really change how you view and understand things. You know, and so part of that, I encourage you, is to do your own study to say, gee, is Israel separate from the church? I think there's a lot of good evidence that says it is, but there are brothers and sisters out there who have completely been convinced of the opposite idea. You know, so there, there it is. Um, I, have, I have a hard time with it myself because I think there's some really straightforward scriptures that show a distinction. But see, part of it is, is that there's also a lot of verses that show that we have joined the blessings of Israel. You know, the book of Galatians and Ephesians talk about this, you know, this joining in the body of Christ. But is the body of Christ still distinct from Israel? And I think so, because my number one evidence, I've talked about this before, is the book of Romans, chapter 11, where Paul, I mean, he blatant in his description of what's going on, a very, very descriptive, not, he, he's not even like, leaves guesswork in this stuff, he's like, really talks about God's plan, so that, but how you view that can change how you look and, and understand end times issues. So that's the whole idea. I'm, I'm giving you these things, uh, maybe some of it, you're like, wow, this is a lot of information, kind of confusing. Well, that's why I gave you a handout. I encourage you, go back to it. The greatest part of this for me is I hope that every one of you are going to be like the Berean believers that Paul bumped into, where Paul comes and tells them about Jesus, and they're like, really? And then, and then they, he says that they were more noble than anybody else, and they went and searched the scriptures to see if what Paul said was true. So, you know what? If this gets you into the Word, discovering and finding things, whether or not you believe or trust or understand it that way, yay. I've done my job. I've done my job. So that's the idea. It's just like to, to get you into the Word, to get you understanding and chewing on it a little bit more. Because understanding these things, every time we go into the Word, we're going to discover how God is working, how God is working in us, what he's doing, what he's about. And especially with end times, you're only going to discover and get more excited about it. You're going to be excited about Jesus coming back. Because that's, what they, that's one part of it. I, I don't emphasize it a lot, but, you know, I do understand. And 
the idea of reminding everybody, hey, you know what? Like my old pastor, Leo, used to say, guess what, everybody? We are one day closer. And he was right. And it's a good thing to remind ourselves of all the time. And so as we bring this uh, message to a close today, I just want to remember uh, that when you read your Bible, even on not end times issues, when you read your Bible, you're always approaching it with your mind view. Your, every bit of your experiences are going right into that Bible reading. That's why you have to do a baggage check before you go into your Bible reading. I mean, it might even be just that day. You might bring something from that day into your Bible. Now, it might be a good thing. It might be something the Lord says, hey, I want you to bring that bag because I'm going to deal with that bag today. That's fine. But just realize that you're doing it. Always realize that you're doing that. So it's just, so bringing baggage into your study is not always a bad thing. And this, of course, is going to twist the scripture on you and where you suddenly don't look at the scripture with the hope and joy and maybe even some reproof and rebuke the way you ought to. You know, to where it searches your heart. Sometimes your baggage isn't going to let it. You're going to say, oh, no, Lord, I don't want you to look there. And the Lord's like, yeah, let's get in there. No, no, Lord, not there. So we, that's the idea. Always remember that that's going to happen. So there you go. So I want to say this with the, the video going, and I'm, I'll probably put my email on there again. My email is uh, uh, pastorgcfmv at yahoo.com. I'm saying that, and also I want to remind everybody, uh, we're doing part three and part four. I already have one person gave me a really good question. I'm going to bring up that information. But if you have questions or you have like specific issue, you're like, well, Robbie, I, I hope you hit this, at least in this study. You know, shoot me an email. Some of you have my text number. Send me a text. Say, hey, I'd like to maybe hit this issue or I really have this thought about this. Let me know. That would be great. All right? So, Father God, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for the truth of the word of God. We thank you and in prayer this morning. We talked about how the word of God, you know, has the big picture. But when we look at the picture, there's all these details. The details of the picture. God, you're, the picture you have painted in the word of God is, is magnificent. I think of some of, like, the paintings of, of Rembrandt and... Uh, and some of those guys were, the, the, their painting of a scene is 10 feet by 20 feet gigantic painting. And the details that are in there are just enormous. I, I remember when we went to the uh, Hermitage where they painted the ceilings and every corner has some detail, some little bit that somebody put in there. Lord, I just thank you that we can explore those details. But Lord, I pray that we always explore the details humbly, remembering the big picture every time. So Father, I pray that, that you would do that in our hearts. Now, Lord, I pray that as we think about your coming again, help us to praise you just one more time. One more moment of praise. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and praise the Lord.